My name is Robin Campbell, and today I am joined by Mark Cousins, who will be helping me with my radio interview. I'm going to be asking him about all things film. And first of all, I'd like to say, how are you today, Mark? I'm good, thank you, Robin. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a good day. I've been travelling all year, so I've been jet lagged. But for the last few days, I've been here in Edinburgh, and the sun is out, and it's a lovely autumn. The leaves are turning golden, so I'm happy. That's always good. Right, so the first question is, who was or who were your major influences or inspirations when you first started out filmmaking? I've always been, you know, I've always had heroes. My arms are covered with tattoos of my heroes. And so but when I started, I just loved schlocky, horror, scary films like movies of Alfred Hitchcock. But then I started to see films by Orson Welles and people like that. But also I was seeing paintings by Frida Kahlo and I really love her work. And uh, the music of David Bowie was such a crucial thing for me, Echo and the Bunnymen. So you draw your inspirations from everywhere, you know, not only in the field of cinema, you know, music in particular was a big thing for me. The question is, how was it for you when you first started out filmmaking? Like, was it easy to get opportunities or was it hard? It was very hard. I came from a working class community in Belfast. I'd never met anybody who was into the arts at all. None, you know, so many people in film, they're there because their uncle was in film or something like that, you know. So it was, I didn't even think I could become a filmmaker. You know, I thought I would become a motor mechanic like my father, you know. But I was passionate about cinema and passion is this kind of unstoppable energy. Passion breaks through walls. and so I was so determined to be, not to make films, but to be as close to cinema as I could, you know, close to the contours of cinema. And so then I had some ideas and I, I was sitting in a cafe in the late 1980s. I had an idea. I wrote the idea on the napkin in the cafe and sent the napkin to Channel 4 and they commissioned the napkin. You are the man behind the eyes of Orson Welles, which is one spectacular piece of film. I really want to see it again. I always want to make a film about him, or at least dedicated to him. Uh, to be honest, no. You know, I, I've focused for decades now. I've focused, I've hardly done much on American cinema at all. Orson Welles is one of the greats. He's a colossus, one of the great figures of the 20th century. So much has been written about him. So much has been, so, been so many documentaries about him. I frankly have focused more in my own work on African filmmakers or Iranian directors or the great films of India or the great female filmmakers. You know, and I've always tried to be countercultural against challenging the canon in some way. Then I heard that there were all these drawings and paintings of Orson Welles, some things that hadn't been looked at before. And so I thought, here's a way of looking at this kind of colossal imagination through a different lens, through a sort of side door or a back door, you could say. And so I thought, okay, I'll go for it. To follow that up, what is your fascination with Orson Welles? I'm fascinated by anybody who is exuberant, you know, who is really full of life. Orson Welles had that quality. Remember that he not only, as it were, transformed cinema, but he changed radio and theatre as well. And so there's something about his overwhelming lust for life, which is what I really admire. Obviously, as a film lover, what he did in some of his films, particularly Magnificent Ambersons and Chimes at Midnight, I think are wonderful. It is wonderful, but bigger than that was his sense of how to live as if there's no tomorrow. That life is this indelible, unforgettable experience. And that's what I admire more than anything else. Where does your interest from foreign films come from? That's a very good question. I'm interested in things other than myself. You know, I find myself quite boring in a way you know I, i'm sick of my own thought process i've been in my own head all my life and that's a slightly dull place to be so i've always been interested in the other whatever the other is so i've always i've, I've, I've often said that my ignorance is my best friend by which i mean what i don't know is where I should go to, you know, because that's where you discover yourself. When you go to another country, when you encounter a new way of living, a new set of values, a new set of principles, a new set of emotions, you are transformed in some way. And I want to be constantly transformed by art and by life in general. And so, you know, when I 
when I look at foreign films, as, as you call them, I think, actually, they're not foreign. The first time I went to Iran, I thought, I feel at home here. You know, Iran in our media is portrayed as, the, as this foreign place, this different place, this other place. And so I think the more you look at foreign films, you realize they're not foreign. Do you see yourself as a champion for film and filmmakers everywhere? Yeah, I see myself, this sounds terrible, but I see myself as a kind of drug dealer where the drug is cinema. You know, cinema is one of the, the best things in life, in my opinion. You know, it's, cinema was my friend, my consolation, my solace through the hard times in life. You know, I was brought up in a war and I was bullied a lot. All the time there was cinema. It was the thing that kept me safe, it kept me alive kept me on the tracks and so I want to share the love with other people as much as possible I want to talk about cinema with as much with as open-hearted a way as possible as as accessibly as possible but within as much knowledge as possible so yes I am a, I'm a, an advocate for cinema and I'm sort of proud of that and some of my work has had an impact and I'm really proud of that how do you see the rise of Chinese investments in film affecting the world as well as Western cinema? Oh, my God, I didn't expect that question. You know, I think here's the thing. China has underachieved in cinema. China has made great films, like from the 1920s onward. However, for a country that size, it hasn't produced as many great films as it should do. But Chinese films in the 20s, 30s, 40s, late 70s, 80s, 90s, great stuff. There's a real danger with Chinese investment that it's looking for a kind of big blockbuster film, what in China they call the, I think it's called Dapian, which means something like the big movie. I think that the real danger in Chinese investment in cinema is that they're trying to ape another cinematic tradition, the tradition that we call Hollywood. China's got its own stories, its own themes, its own world, its own aesthetics. I think the investment isn't improving cinema either in China or in America. With Brexit looming, do you think it will have a negative impact on the British film industry? My hunch is to say yes. Yeah. We have to evidence this. You can't just be negative. You know, we have to evidence this, and it's too early to say. My hunch is that cinema is an art without borders, uh, sans frontières. And therefore, anything that raises a border is bad for the art of cinema. The best films ever made in the UK and Ireland and Scotland were made by people just in their community. So we don't need the international dimension, but we want our films to be sold internationally and seen all across Europe. The, the, the boring practical stuff is a lot of our cinemas rely on support from the European Union, etc. So I think that our cinemas, will we will see fewer European films, and that's very bad. So the short answer to your question is, it's bad. When you're making a film, do you approach people or do people approach you? Occasionally people will come to me and say, here's a film, it's funded, would you like to direct it? Sometimes that's great, like one, I made a film called Atomic with the, the band Mogwai, and uh, it was fully funded, and that was fantastic. But other times people have come and said to me, would you direct a BMW advert, and we'll pay you a £1,000 a day. And you think, £1,000 a day? Oh my, oh my God. But you say no to that kind of thing, because it's just, it would feel wrong, you know, it would eat at your soul. Occasionally people come to me and I get offered quite a few things to direct. Mostly I'm in a very nice privileged position to be able to say no. Has there ever been a time where you've either scrapped a film idea or stopped the production of a film entirely? Yes, another very good question. The biggest danger when you're making a film is setting off in the wrong track. And very occasionally, I think just once I felt, oh, this is the wrong track, this is going in the wrong direction. I remember once stopping something, thinking, that doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. And it's going to get worse. You don't want to be in that sticky position. The worst feeling as a filmmaker is you're in, in the edit suite and you show your producers and your funders and they think, this isn't the film we wanted. So it's better to kill it off right at the start. Out of everything you've ever made, what is your favourite and why? Co-directed a film with a great Iranian director called Mania Akbari and she and I made a series of short letter films to each other. And it was... It was lovely to collaborate with her. She's a great artist, and I like that one a lot. Some of the things have been very successful, like that book I wrote, the story of film, was translated into loads of languages, and so that was a satisfying thing. But 
think probably Life Maybe is the one that I liked most. If you could, what film or films would you have done differently? You know, I started in television and I directed for a long time in television before I went into movies, as it were, feature-length stuff, you know, and uh, some of the television work. There's one particular film I did with the great Iranian director, Abbas Kirostami. It's 30 minutes long. It was for Channel 4. There's quite a lot of commentary in it, and it didn't need much commentary. But when you're working commercial television, they, they're often told, put in more voice, tell people what they're seeing. So I would remove the commentary from that. More generally, I wish I had been confident earlier. When you come from a background like mine, you know, creative confidence doesn't necessarily come naturally. It took me a long time to realize I had a voice as a filmmaker. And so some of the earlier stuff that I did could be massively improved because I was just trying to copy other people and I didn't have my own voice or my own style. For you, is it harder to figure out who your audience will be when making a film or do you always have your target audience established beforehand? Uh, neither. I never think of the audience. <laughs> you know, because, you know, that sounds arrogant and it's not at all. What you need to do is make something that really moves you and is really the sort of film that you wanted to see. A lot of the things that I make is the sort of film that I want to see. When you think about audience too much, you do, well, regardless of how clever you are, it totally starts to become like demographics. And when you think of audience, often you play it a bit safe. And the creative experience is not about being safe. The creative experience is delving into your own unconscious world, your own dream life, the things that scare you and excite you, and then trying to put them out in a film in as uncensored a way as possible. If you think of the audience, you censor yourself. And nobody, it's a lose-lose proposition because the audience can feel that it's not, it's, you're, you're not telling the full truth. And so I don't think about it. See, that was quite surprising, actually. <laughs> no, I've never, I mean, I've always, you know, it's the punk mentality, you know, don't think of audience. This is kind of a silly one, but what film, like, not one of your own, but you know, in general, has stood out to you either in a good way or a bad way? I see films all the time, uh, and I love films. You know, I love really popular cinema, and I love really arty cinema. I love a six-hour, live Diaz, Filipino, nothing happens film, and I love some of the big action movies. I remember when I saw Mamma Mia, the first of the Mamma Mia films, you know, all the male critics that I knew all hated it. And I just loved it. I thought it was a thing a thing of great beauty, you know, and joy is quite hard to do. And so I, people were surprised when I liked that. But um, I regularly see films that I love, but I also regularly see films that I hate. Like there's a, there's a Paul Thomas Anderson film called Phantom Thread that came out recently, and I just really hated it. And a lot, all the critics really liked it, but I just thought I hated it. And I, I said on Twitter I hated it. And then behind the scenes people said, thank you for saying that, because I hated it too, including some very famous filmmakers who were too scared to say it in public, you know. But, you know, that passion is yeah, important, you know, and, I, you know, and I'll see f maybe 10, 15 films a week. And finally, what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers like myself? Uh, my advice would be don't compromise, don't censor yourself. Uh, don't think of the audience. Uh, I think there's a real danger in that. I would say aim high. Uh, and this, there's, oh, this phrase that has been in my head for decades now from Robert Bresson, the great French director. He said, try to show that which without you might never have been seen. And what he's saying there is, you know, show, put something on the big screen that we haven't seen before. You know, a way of living, an, an attitude to the world, a, a fear, a doubt, a joy, something that we haven't seen before. And I think that's splendid advice because everybody, I think, wants, I want to see new modes of living when I go to the pictures, you know. And so I think that's good advice. Well, thank you so much for having this interview with me and... End of interview.